ETFs are great. Okay, cool. It's like now it's like known. It's not really a, a talking point that you can really you can use it still, but it's just like it's not this thing that's on the horizon that's going to save us um, and, and create this super cycle like well, a lot of us maybe thought. There's still work to be done. Sailor's biggest fear is you know this could, this could if everyone just like stops caring and, and quiet quietly stack sats every day like that doesn't really do anything to for us to, to reach sort of escape velocity and hyper Bitcoinization that we all want to. Bitcoin companies when they start spending marketing dollars. That is the earliest indication of a impending bull market is what I've noticed. And the thing I'm most excited about is uh, this initiative that, that I started uh, at Bitcoin Magazine in partnership with MicroStrategy uh, called Bitcoin for Corporations. And uh, this is basically just an initiative to what's the best way to incorporate Bitcoin into the church world. I definitely think there's a solution. Bringing Donald Trump in about, okay, well, you know, Bitcoin needs to be mega now or like you need to be Republican, like, ew, not any of that. It's like, okay, we have a powerful person who's basically pandering to us. Let's let them pander to us. Mr. George McHale, thank you so much for being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. How are you, sir? I am doing well. How are you, Brandon? Good, good. So good. good. Thank you for... Thank you for joining me. Um, for those who don't know, George is the Vice President of Operations at Bitcoin Magazine. He's a co-author of Thank God for Bitcoin, and he is the author of the new book that he just published is I Am Not Your Bra. I am not your bra, I should say. It's, that's that's an inside joke too, so at some other time. I am not your bra, 21 keys to sound parenting. So um, a couple things, I guess. We'll take it one at a time here, but I want to talk about the conference and get your impressions just of the conference and, and you know what your thought was and kind of where we go from here, but also um, some of the things that you so we'll do that in a second, but I want to get what are you focusing on really? And it could be personal, it could be the business side of things or what have you. I know you're working on the books, but what is the biggest stuff? Obviously, we got a lot of crazy things going on here with the you know, everyone's talking the Japan carry trade and all these different yeah, things, yeah, right? Yeah. What is what is the big thing you're focusing on in the in the Bitcoin space? Is it the mining world? Is it the macro environment collapsing? Like, what is it that you kind of get up every day and you go to Bitcoin Twitter or whatever it is or Noster and you're checking on? Yeah, definitely. I think um, as far as Bitcoin itself goes, I think the thing I'm most excited about is uh, this initiative that that I started uh, at Bitcoin Magazine in partnership with MicroStrategy uh, called Bitcoin for Corporations. And uh, this is basically just an initiative to try to accelerate uh, corporate Bitcoin adoption. Um, you know, kind of the more I've dug in, the more I've seen, obviously, the success of MicroStrategy and Michael Saylor and other uh, companies that have followed suit. And what I've noticed in sort of what we identified in, in forming this partnership is that while there's a ton of sort of inbound, a lot of companies reaching out to Michael Saylor and, and, and wanting to know, like, hey, how did you do this? You know, it's not really a core part of his uh, day to day to be like coaching or offering advice or, or, or whatever. And so the, the goal of this initiative is to sort of go on offense and be proactive in identifying companies that would be well suited to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet and then sort of help uh, educate them and, and uh, amplify them so that we can kind of create this flywheel effect of, you know, companies in the space that want to see this happen, want to see more companies adopt Bitcoin. And we can create this, um, this sort of membership core that's uh, that's accelerating uh, this dynamic. And so uh, that's kind of the day-to-day -day work that I'm, I'm most uh, uh, focused on and I'm excited about. Um, and then, you know, really the, this, this book, I'm trying to find my voice and trying to find a, a place where uh, talking about parenting, uh, not just to Bitcoiners, primarily to Bitcoiners, but really to anyone who will, who will listen. This is uh, something I'm really passionate about. And then um, as I've, as I've wrapped up this book and had more conversations, especially with people who are now, you know, finishing the book and, and reading it and, and, and sharing their feedback, I get really energized by, uh, feeling like, okay, I put something out there that I feel like is, is helpful. And, you know, that's always, always a good feeling. And so, um, so the, I think those are the, the top two things that I'm like, okay, this is the content I want to produce. This is what I want to be talking about. And, uh, you know, I just want to, I want to be helpful. I want to be, uh, I feel like this is an area that I have some, uh, authority and and um, uh, wisdom to share, and so that's that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's that's so cool, and we need so much more of it. Holy cow, do we need more of it? So, um, what in segueing to the question I was talking about a minute ago, just the conference and stuff like that. Um, I guess well, this will be the good segue. I guess you were you were selling books. Uh, you and I, unfortunately, it was just so crazy. I, we did not get to to link up, but you were selling books at the conference, correct? How'd that go? Yeah. It was great. Yeah, we had a book signing. 
Um, I was actually surprised by the number of people who, uh, who came up to me and, and sort of wanted to chat and wanted a signed copy. And so that was a really fun experience. Never, never done that before. Uh, yeah, ended up sell, selling, you know, almost like 70 books, I think, at the conference wow. overall. Um, you know, gave away a bunch at the kids camp, which was also another cool, yeah, uh, cool. Added, added benefit. Um, and had my son there too. So, you know, that was just another kind of treat is him kind of walking around and being able to point to him and be like, yeah, that's my, you know, because people obviously want, want to know like what, who, who you think you're yeah. writing a book, book about parenting. And Where's the like product that. at? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. Proof of work. It's okay. Yeah. Proof of work. Yeah. Don't trust verify oh, all, all the, all the memes. Um, really true. and so, so yeah, that, that was a really cool part uh, of the conference for sure. That's so cool. So overall, what were your impressions of just the conference, you know, kind of how you guys saw it from a, you know, I guess you lightly touch on the business perspective of what you thought. I know we were just kind of joking off stage, like, well, what kind of, what do we do from here? <laughs> like, what do, you, yeah, yeah. what do you do? So, I mean, what were your overall thoughts and just sentiment of the conference and, um, and how things went? Yeah. I mean, from my perspective, it went pr pretty close to flawless, like as close to flawless as you can get at that mm -hmm. scale. And given all of the, oh, the really variables and, and, and things that sort of were thrown at us. So the conference team did an incredible job of, uh, you know, executing on all fronts. Obviously, there's always, there's always room for improvement. And um, yeah, I think there's only so much you can do when you have Secret Service on site. Uh, two, two different Secret Service details on site um, telling you what to do. And, and, um, and when they're, you know, when they're in charge, it's like, it's like, Hey, sorry, I guess we're going to do what they said. Um, so that, that created some challenges, obviously at the conference, long lines and, and all that kind of stuff. But even with that, I feel like, you know, we created, we set the expectations ahead of time. People kind of knew what they were getting themselves into. And, um, I think overall, um, really, really strong content. I think the programming team did an incredible job of curating, uh, the right, uh, uh panels and even just the kind of the order of events and, I like, I like the stage placements this year, uh, having them within the expo hall, I think created a cool vibe, um, where the energy kind of carried over and, and, uh, uh, you know, Donald Trump's speech, um, it was, it was fine. Like it was like, I think people, uh, for whatever reason it was, and maybe it was just like overhyped, uh, in general. Um, I don't think we knew, I don't think anyone really knew what to expect. And so we just expected like, Oh my God, this is going to be price is going to pump or whatever. And I think what he delivered was like, oh, it was okay. It was like, uh, he said some things new that he hadn't said before. He re reaffirmed his commitment to free Ross. And, um, there were some important things that if you listen closely, that, uh, I think, I think were, were wins as Bitcoiners. Um, more importantly, I think he set off, uh, uh, the, the chain event of, of, uh, game theory that is now going to play out and other, every kind of world leader is aware that he was speaking there. So I think that just the fact that we got him and, you know, credit to, to our CEO, David Bailey for grinding for as hard as he did and making it happen. And, uh, you know, uh, that was very, very impressive. Um, the fact that we got him, the fact that he came and he addressed the Bitcoin crowd alone, I think was a huge win for the ecosystem and for kind of what, where we can go from here and what we can do next. Um, I think the, the overall feedback that we're hearing is, you know, mostly positive. I think kind of like me and you were talking about earlier is, it was the most productive conference that I've ever been to personally. Like I got more business done at this conference than any other conference I've been to. It felt like people were there ready to like strike deals. And we made two major announcements. You know, we launched Bitcoin for corporations. We announced uh, Bitcoin magazine, Japan in partnership with, uh, with Meta Planet. So uh, that's exciting. Um, so yeah, man, it's, it was hard to, to not walk away feeling like, okay, we did it. Um, you know, some, especially something that that's that hyped. You're like, yeah, you know, you know, I think, I think, uh, by, by, for all intents and purposes, it was a success. And yeah, now it's like, how do we build on this momentum is, is my big question. Um, and there's a couple layers to that. You know, one is just continuing sort of all the, 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 the seeds that we planted, whether it's Bitcoin for corporations or these other initiatives, but also on the political front, there's kind of a lot of, I think, messy questions <laughs> and, and next steps that we have to figure out. Um, there's kind of this danger of becoming, I think, too partisan. That uh, can be a turn off to to a, a subset of of the the, the Bitcoin um, community, which is what it is. Like I think people are still trying to figure out what that is. A lot of people don't even think there is a Bitcoin community. You know, I I tend to disagree with that. I, I think that, that probably it's just like depends on how you def define the word community. But um, there's definitely Bitcoiners who are you know progressive in their politics. Sorry, I, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, I think the the sort of Twitter. Uh, uh, echo chamber is, is probably more 
uh, right of center, um, which is which is great. I think there's we all we come from all walks of life. I think that's kind of what's what's a little bit beautiful about Bitcoin is that it, it can it can uh, uh, appeal to anyone's uh, sensibilities. And so politics hopefully can kind of be uh, deprioritized in favor of advancing the mission. And I think that was really the goal. Is like this wasn't about bringing Donald Trump wasn't about okay, well, you know, Bitcoin needs to be mega now or like you need to be right. Republican. Like ew not any of that it's like okay we have a powerful person who's basically pandering to us yep let's let them pander let's to move us the other so window yeah 100 percent. let's move the overton window and even yeah. like like the analogy i like to use is um the american revolution right the the early days of the american revolution the 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 rebels were still interfacing with the political apparatus of the day you know war was the last resort <laughs> They were still negotiating. They created their own Congress, right, for a really long time. And we forget this. That kind of is the part of history that we don't really talk about a lot because it's not as exciting as, you know, the, the Revolutionary War. Um, but I think we're kind of in this period where it's like, okay, we got to figure out how we can interface with the political apparatus to our advantage. And a lot of people have different ideas of what that looks like. You know, some people feel like it's very America-centric. Um, some people think it's more global. And, and I think... Uh, I think we have to leverage both and any and all power that panders to us and that wants to um, uh, help bring awareness to, to Bitcoin and help legitimize Bitcoin even more. Uh, I don't I don't buy into the mindset that, you know, uh, we don't have to do anything or that it's a foregone conclusion that we've already won or it's inevitable. I like all that is just like, ah, that all sounds kind of lazy to me, like hold and don't even think about it ever again. I'm like, ah, I, I don't know if that's kind of the, the playbook. Uh, I want to be active. I want to be, uh, I want to be like banging down doors. Yeah. we got work to do, man. Like we can't fall into apathy in, in, in what we're trying to do. And I think it's so easy. It's so easy to just be like, yeah, just stack sats and hold. And all those things are true, but it's like, do those things and be active, be proactive. And whatever that means for you, like in, in my early days of Bitcoin, it was like trying to tell it, talk, talk to everybody about Bitcoin and orange bill, whatever my neighbors. And I've kind of less kind of been in, in that activity and, and more focused on um, the people who are already here and just trying to get us uh, to think about how we can continue to advance the mission in, in our own um, context. And, you know, the one that I'm kind of most focused on is, is at your job. I think there's this mentality among Bitcoiners a lot of times. I want to get a Bitcoin job. I want to work for a Bitcoin company. And um, I'm like, uh, I don't know if you do. Maybe you do, but we need some people too. But like, also we need people working at, you know, IBM and Intel and Microsoft and, you know, working on being the Bitcoiner where they're currently at and slowly planting seeds to help convince the, the people around them, the people who are decision makers and the people in power. And I think the same is true of politics, right? Like, uh, one of the ways that we got in front of Donald Trump was because there were people around him who started, including his own children, right? He, he mentioned this in the speech, who were paying attention to crypto, were paying attention to Bitcoin, and that got him interested. And so that's how we win, right, is if Bitcoiners continue to move the needle wherever they are. So that's what I want to encourage. And I, I don't think we should we should uh, retreat from any any battlefield, that, any, any front that we're on, whether it's the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or uh, corporate adoption or, you know, in your neighborhoods, like whatever it is. For you, whoever it is that you're talking to, being the Bitcoiner in your space, I think is critically important. And, you know, just to kind of plug the book one more time, in your own household, right? Like if you can't orange fill your own family, like what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing trying to orange fill uh, anyone else? So, um, you know, I have a whole chapter uh, in the book called A Bright Orange Future, where we talk about the ways that we've implemented uh, Bitcoin in our own home, um, starting with, you know, paying our, our kids to do work. Uh, we, don't, we don't believe in allowance. We don't believe in just giving money for free for doing for existing. Yep. Right. Um, that's not a thing. It's it is if, if we have a job at the house that we feel like you can perform uh, something that I would pay for, uh, pay someone else for anyway, I will hire you as my mm -hmm. you know, to do this and I will pay you with sats. And so um, and then just kind of continuing to teach them and talk openly about money and talk about inflation and talk about the way that things are getting expensive and helping them be aware of what's happening and why it's happening and how Bitcoin is a solution has been really, really effective. And then also just like helping them with the practical stuff, set up a wallet. And, um, you know, we've, we've been fortunate enough to, to get our kids started at a really young age where they've, they've watched their wallet grow and mm -hmm. they're like, whoa, this, this Bitcoin thing is no joke. And so again, it goes back to, to low time preference. If your kids are really young and you start as early as they can kind of comprehend or, or, or be with it, they're going to have that same experience. They're going to, they're going to watch it grow and they're going to 
be intrigued and start paying attention to it. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the big takeaway is like be in the Bitcoin or wherever it is that you're at and don't be apathetic and don't expect this thing to be inevitable. Like we got work to do. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Get on the mission. Let's go. Um, because this is something that you and I, when we met, we were talking about, you know, kids, you know, what's going on. I love the book. Uh, what prompted you to write this book? Yeah, I mean, this book kind of was prompted. Actually, I brought my son to a Bitcoin conference uh, a couple of years ago. My son Kingston, he was 13 at the time. And he just kind of impressed everybody there, including myself. I was like, oh, wow, this is this- is actually pretty amazing. Um, you know, and it's easy to say that about your own kid, but I had multiple people coming up to me, people I work with, people that were just there. Uh, he just kind of got his grind on and just started started working. And uh, it was one of those things where I was kind of nervous to bring him at first. I was like, I got to kind of, you know, I'm going to be working. So, you know, hopefully you're going to figure it out. And, and he totally just like jumped in, made himself useful. And um, yeah, I had, had people coming up to me after that, like, yo, what did you, what did you do? What did you teach this kid? Like, uh, it would be really, really valuable actually, uh, if you would r- write some of this stuff down. And so, um, that's ultimately what kind of inspired the book. You know, I kind of walked away from that feeling like, okay, I got some like kind of credibility, I guess, as a parent now. And, you know, a lot of people, we started really young. I was 21 when we had Kingston and a lot of people, uh, a lot of my friends, people my age are, are you know, just now starting to have kids or they have younger kids. And so, I was like, hey, if this can be helpful, I, I would love to kind of write down my thoughts and and share what my wife and I have been doing for you know the past sixteen years. That's so cool. How how long did it take you to write it? Um, I started in January and it was late nights. So I would just kind of get on at like eleven p.m. until like two a.m. every day for a while. And I think overall, start to finish, including edits and everything, like five to six months overall. Dang. That's awesome. Did you, is that something that you did, uh, like any ghostwriting help or just, you did it yourself or like, is that just pounding through it? Yeah, no, I wrote the whole book, uh, myself, my wife, uh, was, a was a huge part in sort of the editing and, and fact checking process. <laughs> I'm like, I can say this, right. This is what we, this is what we did. Um, it was actually cool. It was a family kind of project. I had, uh, my daughter actually designed the cover. Um, and Kingston, my son, uh, helped me kind of just g- gave feedback and like, uh, order of, of where things should go and things like that. So, and of course, you know, he was kind of the inspiration for it, both, both my kids really, but, um, yeah, so it was cool to kind of collaborate with, with, uh, my family on this. And, um, but yeah, the writing part, that was, that was probably all me and, uh, you know, really, really enjoyed it. I love, I love writing. I'm, I'm already like chopping it a bit to get to the next one, but, uh, but yeah, really, really pumped to see this one out in the wild. What do you have? Uh, can you give us any, uh, little, insight into what the next uh, one might be? You know, I don't know yet. I've, I've kicked around a few different ideas. Um, I, you know, the reason I, I wanted to write this book uh, with sort of a Bitcoin audience in mind, it's a parenting book, but you know, the people that I've kind of written it for is, is Bitcoiners uh, who are new parents is because I feel like, it, you know, Bitcoin's kind of at this stage now, it's like what, 13 years old. It's kind of, kind of a teenager, kind of in its adolescence, if you will. Um, and we've kind of seen a lot of just like the primers and like the, here's what Bitcoin is type, uh, books and content be, be written already. I feel like, and that, that market seems a little bit saturated. And so I think the next sort of stage in our growth as, as a community is these kind of more lifestyle and, and Bitcoin adjacent type, um, books and, and videos and podcasts. You're kind of starting to see this with podcasts, uh, where kind of the, the pure Bitcoin podcasts have kind of started to, a little bit fade, you know, I think there's been a couple of recent announcements where they're, they're sunsetting some of them. And I think people are just kind of, we've kind of heard it all, right? It's like, yep, I get it. 21 million, you know, digital gold, whatever else, uh, what, what else can we talk about? And now it's like, okay, how do we as Bitcoiners exist in the world, in the real world, like in our day-to-day lives? And uh, parenting to me is, is kind of a uh, top priority. And I think it's uh, in a lot of ways uh, for, for, to, to borrow like a kind of Bitcoin phrase, it's, it's the most uh, lowest time preference activity you can participate in, right? Like um, the world is hard and there's a lot of things broken and everybody, or most people, I guess, want to change. They want to see the world change for, for the better. And there's a lot of things that we can do in our day to day to kind of make incremental improvements. But really, if you think about having kids and, and intentionally investing in them, um, when they grow up, if, if everyone kind of adopts that mindset, when they grow up, then we have a new generation of leaders um, who can actually make real impactful change. And so that's kind of my, my thesis. I love that. And that's why like, again, you and I, you know, hit it off, you know, you know, months ago in that vein, cause that's, you know, we're talking kids books and, you know, the stuff that you and I are writing and, and just publishing over time. And it's, 
it's it's so like you said it's the true bitcoin ethos of low time preference you know because it's instead of like trying to put band-aids on bullet holes the whole time which is you know whatever it is you know trying to convert the king trying to get rid of the fed you know like all these things if you just spent 10 15 20 years you know society or three five ten percent of society just raising your kids and pouring into them you wouldn't have to worry about any of those things right the whole whole society would just flip and it would just it would just start going the right direction and they would have the ethos and that's what we obviously have kind of gone through a lack of that the last 50 years of parents are gone they're out of the home they're not teaching the kids they're in whatever they are and so they're not getting what they need and so now we have this world devoid of any direction so I, I love it's yeah it's the whole it's the whole um you know good times create so, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know soft men meme it's, it's literally that kind of playing literally. out it really so is. we have to actually have a strategy. It's like, oh, yeah, that's a funny meme. Yeah, it feels true. But like, okay, what are we doing about what it? Do we do? <laughs> <laughs> right. It is. It's, it's so true. What are, so in saying that, some of the strategy in a way, like what are some of your, you know, and I know you're biased and you could, we could say your name all 21, but what are some of your like favorites or things that kind of stand out? Or maybe, maybe ones that kind of come up a lot when you're talking to other people, other parents that are kind of coming up and asking you things. What are some of those that kind of come to your head? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the main one really is the book's title. Uh, it starts by recognizing and acknowledging the fact that, you know, your, your child is, is not your friend. First and foremost, you have a fundamentally different relationship that's unique. It's different than any other relationship. And um, I think sort of what has been transpiring in our, in our current society is this idea that, you know, we're supposed to be our kid's friend. And it's kind of led to like this generation of like really soft parenting and people have become uh, afraid of like discipline and <laughs> authority and like all these big scary words Ooh, and boogie yeah boogie uh, man, <laughs> right and so you know I, I spent a lot of time in the book just kind of trying to reestablish some of the very basics of like hey it's okay to tell your kid like no <laughs> believe it or not um, and you know it's okay to establish authority and respect and and in fact your kid craves that right. Um, and so it really, that's the foundation of the entire book. I'm not your bra. You know, don't call me, don't literally don't call me bra. Um, that's, that's something that it's just like cringe when I hear like uh, a, a little kid say like, bro, it's a mom. Uh, actually one of, one of the other inspirations for this book is I saw this, um, marketing campaign, I think it was around mother's day. And it was this, this shirt that said, it just said bra in really big letters. And then, uh, underneath it, it said formerly known as mom. And, you know, I giggled a little bit like, huh? And then I thought about it. I was like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. It's not bra, formerly known as mom. Like, that's not even a cute t-shirt. Like, we, like, it's become, it's become kind of laughable. It's become kind of this like, okay, I guess I'm just bra. And um, my encouragement is that first and foremost, parents need to sort of reassert their authority and sort of reestablish um, this dynamic that I'm the parent, you are the child. And, you know, you know, this is my household kind of thing. All, all of the things that, um, again, our, our current society kind of winces at a little bit because we become so afraid of, of leadership, frankly. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. It just, you could just go down so many rabbit holes with that. And it's just, you know, the lack of parenting, a parent's gone out of the home or whatever it is, or the fathers are gone. Right. And it's like, you used to be like, when we grew up, it's like, you got your butt whooped. I remember, I remember the last time I ever, I think I talked back to my mom, I was like 12 or 13 and I was. I was, I was a big kid. I was probably, I don't know, five, 10 or you know, six foot somewhere in there, five, 10, five, 11, 175 pounds at like 13 years old, 14 years old. And I remember I said something to my mom and I'll never forget my dad, like sprints across the house and just, just dummies me. Yeah, like, like just throws me <laughs> into, the, into the drywall. And I never, ever did anything again after that. Right. It was just like, uh, you need that, you, you know, not every yeah. kid does, but, but like right. you know, some kids need it, you know? And my dad yeah. was like, yeah, when you were three, I realized I was raising a criminal. And I, I needed to, you know, I needed to do something. So it's, ah, I just love like, like this, what you have written. It's so important because like you said, not everyone, you know, I, that's, that's one of my privileges in a way, right? The last 50 years, we've had a lot of fathers or whoever that have been out of home. My, my, I was privileged to have a father and someone that cared enough to, to whoop me and put me into shape and stuff like that, where now like, like you, to your point, a lot of people, like you just said, it's okay to say no. A lot of people don't know that. Like they've never grown up experiencing that or seeing that as an example. So that's why I think this is so incredibly important. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And and so yeah, I think that's kind of the the foundation of of the book is that um, you know the, the the relationship is fundamentally different. Um, again, to a lot of other you know themes that I think are really important. Um, obviously, speaking to parents and um, emphasizing the fact that uh, I have this I have a line that's like ninety three percent of parenting is working on yourself. 
believe it or not, it starts, you know, by looking in the mirror and being like, okay, if I expect this child to behave in a certain way, then I can't be a hypocrite, you know? Um, and so uh, the other 7%, by the way, is teaching them about Bitcoin, obviously. Um, and then you have complete, that's, this is sound parenting. So the, yeah, the, the subtitle of the book is 21 keys to sound parenting. And so, um, I, I kind of get into that a lot. You know, I found when I was writing the book, I would go in, in, in and out of like talking to parents about like, Hey, you know, consider teaching your kid this. And then, uh, also being like, Oh, well, you should also do that <laughs> just as a person, as an adult, this is actually good advice for, you know, everyday people. So, um, that was a, a constant kind of back and forth that like, we, we actually really do need to consider like what, uh, how are we behaving and what kind of example are, are we setting? And it sounds really simplistic. And a lot of the book really is, it's like the fundamentals, it's the basics, man. It's like, um, you know, the, the, you are a mirror for your, for your child. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely another major theme. Um, I can keep rattling them off, but like, you know, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to spend the time just unpacking the whole, yeah. the whole no, thing. no. And I, we want people to go get the book. Uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's, that's perfect. What, what was, we'll transition a little bit here. What was your, so we're talking about, you know, raising the next generation. How, how were you raised? Like, what was your orange bill story? Like kind of, what was this, the start for you? Like all the way up until finding Bitcoin and what was that process like? Yeah. So, um, so I was born in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, so immigrated to the United States when I was four years old. So immigrant parents, um, mm -hmm. a lot of the stereotypes you may have heard are very true. <laughs> you know, it was, uh, and there was obviously a culture shock coming, coming to America where, um, you know, I would make, make friends and kind of experience it sort of a, a different type of dynamic in, in their homes. And I'd want to go visit them and, and come home and, and be like, Hey, you know, Bobby's parents do this, this, and this. And, you know, my dad would be like, Pfft. Get out of here. What were we, we, we were even talking about? Um, and, so, <laughs> and so, you know, very conservative Christian household, grew up in a Coptic Orthodox Christian home, went to church every Sunday. Um, and so, you know, grew, grew up in a home where I, I understood that, you know, I was to respect my parents um, and, uh, you know, what they said. Like, I, there wasn't a lot of like room for negotiation and things like that. And um, and so I think that obviously helped kind of shape my my worldview. Um, I would say another major theme in, in my household growing up was hard work. Um, you know, as, as immigrants, my, you know, I remember my dad working three jobs when we, when we first arrived and, you know, the, the graveyard shift at, at Jack in the box was, <laughs> was one of them and just doing what they could to make ends meet and to kind of, you know, learn the language and, and sort of, uh, build the American dream really. Like I, I like to think of my parents as sort of the, um, the epitome of the American dream. Like they actually realized it, uh, you know, they bought the house, you know, didn't quite have the white picket fence, but like, you know, close enough. Um, and so there's, there was a lot that I admired about my parents. So it was a very loving home. I, I feel like I had a great childhood. We didn't have a ton of money, you know, we, we were, we were very much, you know, sort of lower middle class, but, um, I feel like there was always kind of like, pro you always see progress, uh, just based on, you know, my parents working hard and sort of, we, we would go from a, you know, apartment to them buying the first house to then moving up to a slightly bigger house, but it was always very like modest, right? Like, um, and, and so I always, yeah, I always looked up to them, always admired them and, um, knew, knew that this was a home that was full of love and they were doing everything they could, uh, for their kids, even, even immigrating, you know, moving away from Egypt was a move saying we want what's best for our three children. And they wanted to create a better life for us. And, you know, I can say mission accomplished uh, on many fronts. And so, um, so yeah, I have a lot to, to owe uh, to, to them for kind of the way uh, I view parenting. And I mean, you know, this as a parent, no one really prepares you fully. Um, there's a lot of things about, <laughs> about when you have your first kid where it's just like instincts kick in. And, um, but there is a lot that's learned. There's a lot that, you know, you pick up and you start kind of repeating the patterns for better or worse from, from your parents. And there's also, I think a tendency to, if your parents did something that you didn't like, there's a tendency to, to just kind of have the pendulum swing the complete opposite way and be like, I don't want to be like my dad. So I'm not going to do the thing that he did. And that can be also really unhealthy. I think there's, there's yeah. kind of a balance that needs to be struck of like, okay, why did my dad do that? I didn't like it at the time, but you know, as an adult, I can kind of reflect and, and see the value in that. We all have those moments of like, oh, okay, I see, mm -hmm. I see why, I see why my parents did that. So true. Um, and so, I, so yeah, that was that was my childhood. I, I think we see a lot of that right now. I think we're living at such a great mm -hmm. point, and I've really heard no one talk about it. I mean, we're living through. I feel like the last decade or two, last couple of decades, I should say, in this um, like counter. I'm trying to think of the right word. I don't know this counter like uh, parenting where it's like, well, 
my parents did this. So like, you know, I'm not going to do that to my kids, Th- things like right. that. <laughs> it's like, right. it's this weird dynamic we're in right now, but you know, anyway, um, yeah. what's, what was your, so you have all that, you know, your, your child, you know, rearing years and, you know, in, in being raised by your parents, what was the, where's the financial world come in? Like, was money talked about? Was that, you know, where did you start all of a sudden? Like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta figure out this money thing. And then, and then eventually finding Bitcoin. What did that look like? Yeah. So I think, I think from my childhood, uh, again, hard work was kind of the, the foundation. I was always like mm-hmm. from a really, really young age, I like was trying to get a job and trying to figure out how to make money and, you know, mowing lawns, doing all the things. This is, you know, I was coming to age at the time the internet was becoming a thing and like was the first person to be like, how do I, how do I make this into a money-making opportunity? And, um, I actually started an online shoe business, fun fact, uh, when I was like 14 years old, rarefootwear.com it was called. And, uh, I set up a, a, a deal with a, a, uh, broker in China that shipped, uh, knockoff Jordans and Air Force Ones. And so I was the, the shoe dealer at my school and, <laughs> um, Made a lot of money with that. Just kind of a random fun fact, but uh, you know, I was always interested in, in making money. I was al- always interested in how money works. Um, in my early career, I was in the mortgage business. Uh, worked for for Wells Fargo for many years, and uh, kind of had front row seats to the great financial crisis. And um, being at Wells Fargo in particular at the time, you kind of again you kind of saw behind the curtain. You saw how the sausage was made, and a lot of it was just really gross, like seeing what was playing out on the news versus the conversations I was having with, you know, my clients at the time, you know, this is in the days of like the old uh, stated income, stated asset loans, where it was like anybody, you, all you had to do was like fog, fog a ninja, fog a mirror, you know, here's your new house. Um, so seeing that reality play out while that the economy was, was uh, collapsing was kind of a wake up call. It was kind of like, okay, wait a minute. What's, what's, what's happening here? Um, I think that was kind of the start of me really thinking about things a little bit differently and asking more and more questions about money. Um, and then a uh, career change in about 2011, I started uh, working for a large church, the church I was attending in Seattle at the time. Um, I was our executive pastor, which means I was sort of, I was number two in charge um, of kind of the operations, the, the business side of the church. And this is like 8,000 people. We had, you know, seven locations in the Seattle area, $12 million a year budget. Uh, large operation, right? You know, hundred people staff. And um, w- we went through a journey. And if you kind of, if you kind of Google me, you'll see I've, I've been through <laughs> a lot of uh, uh, different uh, worldviews and I've kind of experienced, especially on the spiritual side of things. I've, I've kind of been a part of the most conservative church imaginable all the way to literally the most progressive church in America, uh, in New York city called the Riverside church um, and kind of everything in between. And through that, I've kind of I've learned a lot. I've observed a lot about just how churches, in particular, function, and how that w- the downstream impacts of society and politics and culture. And what I mean by that, specifically as it relates to money, is uh, my observation was that pastors were incentivized primarily to make you comfortable. So whatever kept the tithes rolling in, whatever kept the the, the primary donors happy, whatever kept the constituency pleased, is what you would hear from the pulpit. And that didn't sit right with me as someone who actually actually kind of believed the message of Jesus and saw the, the things that uh, he was saying were very offensive to the sensibilities of the present, you know, his cult, the culture at the time. And I wasn't seeing that in the church. I wasn't seeing pastors call out, you know, what was happening in the economy. I wasn't seeing them call out the bankers and, and say, like, speak truth to power, if you will. They were literally just like, it was just becoming entertainment. And, um, and so I experienced that firsthand, um, one of the, the churches I was at at the time, we made a you know pretty bold, I guess at the time, uh, stand for the LGBTQ community. And, and this was uh, something that cost us dearly in, in terms of like the, the, the way that the church, church responded. Um, and I remember kind of being really unsettled by that. Um, and regardless of kind of my own personal beliefs about kind of what we were doing, felt like felt like it was like the loving thing to do. And the world has changed a lot, by the way. I'm, <laughs> so stick with me. If I lost you at like LGBTQ inclusion, like, you know, the, obviously the story has a, a different ending. But, um, you know, it was it was a really interesting thing to, to watch just basically everybody uh, uh, stop giving and, and, and stop. Uh, supporting the church and, and watching the church die. So here you have a pastor and a, and a sort of church leadership sort of do what they felt was, you know, appropriate. And this is before woke culture was a big thing. This is before, you know, everything. 
Um, and then, and then having that not really resonate and then watching the way that other churches responded by being sort of, um, uh, ambiguous about their stance. And it became this game of like, well, we're not going to tell you what we think about this very controversial thing because we want you to continue to give. Um, and so, yeah, that, that I think was kind of the first like departure, uh, from one, one worldview to recognizing that, okay, it's a lot more complicated than, than people realize. Um, the next big change was COVID. Um, so I got into Bitcoin, uh, in 2017. So I was already kind of getting orange pilled by this time. And when I was pretty, you know, uh, progressive and I would call myself woke at the time. Um, and I started a, a nonprofit organization. It's called church clarity. Sorry, we're going in deep. Hopefully, hopefully this is okay. Uh, <laughs> church, church, church clarity was an organization that, uh, the way I designed it was basically to, confront churches to basically just disclose their, their policies. Okay. So like, what do you, how do you enforce a policy around a gay couple that comes to your church and wants to get baptized? And the whole thing about church clarity was like, we're not taking a stand. We're not telling you what to think. We're not saying you have to be inclusive or not inclusive. We're just saying you have to be clear, right? Clarity is reasonable was our, was our tagline. And so it was kind of meant to offend everybody a little bit, like, and, and challenge everybody. Like, I don't really, I don't care if you believe that the Bible says this, then you should say that. Don't be vague about it so that you can kind of catfish people and then, and then, you know, cut their legs out from under them at the last minute. And um, I was fully expecting it to sort of have uh, resonance with conservative churches because, you know, why, why wouldn't you be like, this is what I believe and I'm going to say it boldly. And um, to my surprise, again, it did kind of <laughs> like offend more people than what I had hoped. I would hope more people would get on with, with the mission. Um, but this led to kind of creating this organization that ended up getting kind of, um, I would say, co-opted by, uh, you know, um, woke uh, people who were a part of it. And in 2020, when COVID hit, um, th that was kind of the last wake up call. It was like, I went to Church Clarity's board and I was like, okay, I think this COVID thing is crazy. I don't know if you remember at the very beginning, churches were shutting down. Um, and I said, we should create another criteria of whether or not your church is going to be open for COVID. And the, again, I don't care if you are or if you're not, just, you know, let's just disclose it. Let's just let the people know, right? And I basically got canceled by my, my own uh, organization that I started they're like, you're what? No way. If you keep your church open right now, you know, like we're not going to promote that and all this kind of stuff. And so I was like, okay, this isn't what I thought it was. What are, what are we even talking about anymore? And so um, that was, I, I would say, a pretty hard kind of transition for me just because I would poured so much into a specific movement and a specific uh, group of people in the community. And then to kind of feel like backstabbed, that was like, a, oh, okay, cool. This isn't what I thought it was. Um, and then it was around that time around COVID was when, when the kind of woke virus really, really started taking off. And, um, I saw it for what it was because I was kind of on the inside for, for a while and, and it just became a, a huge turnoff. And so now I'm at, at this point where I'm like, probably lean more, I guess, conservative in, in my, in my worldview in a lot of ways, uh, but kind of sick of all, all of it and, and just kind of call, call BS on the, on the whole apparatus. Uh, but yeah a little bit of an orphan as it comes to like spirituality and things like that. So um, probably more than you bargained for with that question, but that's, that's kind of where, how I got no, That's here. amazing. That's amazing. So, so Bitcoin starts getting intertwined into this and start getting orange, orange pilled, what you said, 2017 ish around there. And then yep. does that, does that, does Bitcoin enter any of the, the church discussions or anything you were doing there at that organization or. It was, it was definitely something I was trying to do. And actually at the time I was probably more experimenting with, you know, shit coins and trying to figure mm -hmm. out how to incorporate, how to tokenize, you know, tithes yeah, and all that yeah. kind of stuff. So that was kind of more my mindset. Um, and it wasn't until 2019 that it became sort of Bitcoin only. Um, I launched an organization uh, with Russell Okun um, called Bitcoin Is. We, d we hosted an event in L.A., and actually that, that event, I think, was the, really the start of my, my Bitcoin only journey. And I, I think if you ask a lot of people who were there and even just kind of reflecting on some of the, the people who were, who were in attendance, um, that was probably a turning point for them, too, where they were kind of like, you know, dabbling in shit coins a little bit, went to that event. And our approach really was to be Bitcoin only in a way that was like not really concerned with Ethereum and everything else that was happening. It was more let's just talk about Bitcoin and its benefits and let everything else kind of you know work itself out. And I think that resonated with, with a lot of people, you know, we had Saifa Dean speak, we had uh, Alex Gladstein speak and, you know, Pomp and, and all the others, but, um, but yeah, it, it kind of, 
the the church component i think i think is still up for for debate in terms of like what's the best way to incorporate bitcoin into the church world i definitely think there's a solution uh in terms of kind of the, the problem i identified of, of pastors having the correct incentives um and it probably starts with some sort of bitcoin reserve strategy uh you know that you can fall back on uh so that you can say the truth of you know the gospel right. or whatever you know whatever your perspective is um, I just want people to tell the truth. Like <laughs> that was my whole thing the whole time is like, just say what you yeah. mean instead of say what you think people want to hear, nice. you know? Yeah, it truly is. It's like you said, it's the fiat incentives, you know, they right. mask the truth many times, right? You're incentivized not to do the truthful things or, or what have you. Um, where, so where does thank God for Bitcoin co-authoring that book and in Bitcoin magazine, uh, where do those things all kind of fit in the, in those following couple of years right there? Yeah, so um, the Bitcoin is event 2019. I uh, met Jimmy Song. He was one of the speakers. Okay. And this is when it's again a time where I was like feeling kind of lost in the church world. And he was, and, and actually, I was so progressive in my in my views that I had kind of dismissed anybody who was like a Christian. Um, and it created a lot of conflict in my life, as you can imagine, with my parents, with you know, um, my in laws, and, and people I grew up with, and all that kind of stuff. And and when I when I met Jimmy. I remember thinking, uh, okay, here's someone who's a Bitcoiner. And now, now I'm like very, very like high on Bitcoin and, and very excited. And he was someone I was uh, learning from quite a bit. Um, and he was also a Christian. And I remember thinking like, okay, well, I can't reconcile those two things of like, I respect this person for his Bitcoin views, but I'm like uh, unsure about his Christian views. So I decided to just kind of go like headfirst into this, <laughs> this tension. And I reached out to him and I was like, Hey man, great, you know, great to meet you or whatever. I noticed you're a Christian. Uh, we should kind of, we should talk more. Maybe the, I think there might be a book here. Uh, like we should figure out this whole Bitcoin, uh, uh, spirituality thing. It seems like there's a lot of overlap. And so, you know, we got together, we started a, a book club, um, and we started reading the, the ethics of, of money production. And out of that book club, uh, this, this group of authors kind of emerged and, um, Jimmy and I kind of led the, the, uh, the process of, of having this book come together. And what was cool about it was, you know, at the time, um, all eight of us, I think, kind of sp spanned the the spectrum of how Christian you are, uh, um, you know, how, how conservative or how progressive you are in your, in your Christian worldview. Yet we all were able to agree on this book, the you know, the contents of this book. And it was a it was a process of like a lot of cutting, a lot of like uh, uh, debates and arguing and like, no, I don't want this. No, that's not relevant for this book. And uh, but at the end this group of eight people who had very different views on, on spirituality uh, were able to agree on, on uh, what's been, I think a very successful, uh, very popular book. And so, um, so yeah, that's how that, that book kind of came, came together. And I um, uh, also met uh, CK Christian Corollas at, at this Bitcoin is uh, event. And we kind of became friends um, and kind of kept in, in touch. And when I saw, a role uh, open up at Bitcoin Magazine. Um, I, I reached out to him as the director of marketing role uh, at the time, and um, yeah, one thing led to another. Got an interview, and um, yeah, I got hired on. That's wild. Uh, That's so cool. So now, quite the journey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is a heck of a journey. I know we're getting towards the end. I got a couple, um, you know, a couple left. I wanted to, to ask you before we play a little word association game, a little lightning round to wrap it up. Um, what have you learned from, I mean, you know, we all work for Bitcoin, you know, like literally and figuratively, right? Like we work to earn Bitcoin, but we also work to promote Bitcoin, right? Like, and this is kind of what you've been touching on. We all in some way, shape or fashion work for Bitcoin. What have you learned in terms of, you know, doing marketing at Bitcoin magazine from, you know, just being around Bitcoin mag, really one of the biggest or organizations inside of, of Bitcoin throwing the biggest conference. What have you learned, whether, because it's something that I think about a lot, a lot with Bitcoin trading cards. It's, it's, it's my role, with Bitcoin trading cards, um, education, uh, promoting Bitcoin in general, like you said, to your family, friends or whatever. What are some you know, nuggets maybe that you've kind of seen or you know, people can maybe add to their, to you know, some, some arrows in their quiver to help Orangeville people or kind of just get out there more, whether it's your business or maybe it's just you trying to Orangeville people? Yeah. Um, so, one, so one of the more like practical tips that I've, that I've heard kind of along the way um, has been anytime that you're buying something, whether it's at the grocery store or, you know, farmer's market or whatever, uh, just asking, like, Hey, do you accept Bitcoin? Um, it's such a great 
one liner that, you know, you're not trying to be like, Hey, let me tell you about how to onboard and let me show you these th tools or whatever, just asking the question. And then obviously they're going to say no, nine times out of 10. Um, it plants a seed with people like, Oh, that's weird. And I mean, no, we don't accept Bitcoin, but like, that's an easy conversation thing where you're not really being that weird. You're kind of more just, we're, we're doing the active work of normalizing uh, Bitcoin uh, for merchants. Uh, so that's one that like kind of st has stuck with me. Um, another one is that uh, Bitcoin companies, when they start spending marketing dollars, that is the earliest indication of a impending bull market is what I've noticed. And I've, I've kind of been here now for uh, a full cycle. So I've kind of seen it, I've seen the money dry up. And then once it starts coming back, it, happens before price action. And so uh, it's a lead indicator. So a little, little TA, if, uh, a little bit there. Uh, but, um, and then, you know, I think the other thing is just that, yeah, we are, we, we are the biggest and, and we're kind of the loudest and we have the largest event and, but we can't do sort of all, all the work, obviously no one expects us to, we don't, we're not the sole sort of arbiter of, of Bitcoin news or communication. There's a ton of great companies doing great work and every podcast I think matters. And um, I think it's just, I've become acutely aware of the fact that there is no marketing budget for Bitcoin. There is, no, there is nobody that's going to do this work. Um, you know, we've, we've managed to create a sustainable business and uh, others have too, uh, around kind of solely being focused on advancing uh, the mission and advancing uh, Bitcoin adoption in a lot of ways, and maybe as like second order effects. But um, the fact that it's it, this is a feature, not a bug. The fact that there's no headquarters, there is no CEO, there is no marketing department for Bitcoin is a very real thing. That again, if we if we ignore, uh, we become apathetic to, then nothing happens. So kind of our earlier point about like sailors' biggest fears, you know, this could, this could if everyone just like stops caring and and quiet quietly stacks sats every day, like that doesn't really do anything to for us to to reach sort of escape velocity and hyper Bitcoinization like we all want to and. Even even with big moments of momentum, like you know whether it's ETFs or um, different companies putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet and announcing it, or, or big movements in price, um, those tend to just kind of like fizzle, right? Like no one's really ETFs are great, okay, cool. It's like now it's like known. It's not really a, a talking point that you can really you can use it still, but it's just like it's not this thing that's on the horizon that's going to save right. us um, and and create this super cycle like we, a lot of us maybe thought was going to happen. So yeah, it just kind of goes back to the earlier point of like, there's still work to be done. So true. So true. Yeah. And it, it makes me think of, um, you know, now to, like the old saying of there used to, there was two, there's two ways to affect change, the ammo box and the ballot box. And, and now we have, we have so many more now, you know, like we have th really, I think of three more, we can vote with our feet, you know, people can easily move where, you know, you couldn't for thousands of years, really, you, you couldn't move easily. You couldn't, you know, you can uh, vote with your voice now in your wallet. Again, other, two other ways right. that we have. It's so much easier for at least people in the Western world to do these things. And that's why I think it's so key. Like you have five ways you can affect change. And, and hopefully it's not the ammo box, yeah. but those other four, I mean, boy, oh boy, <laughs> like that when you're not doing the ammo box and the ballot box, which again, the ammo box doesn't happen often, fortunately. And then the ballot box once every four years or two years or whatever it is, but your feet, voice and wallet, it's so important. I think that that's like a lot of the crux of our talk is, is around that, right? Building this foundation and low time preference. It's walking the talk of what if our Bitcoiners, are we yeah. really going to live up to that standard that we keep preaching on the internet, you know, or, or at conferences or whatever. Yeah. So I, I just love that you say that. hundred uh, percent. What, yeah. what, so you touch on that if you want to. And my, my last real one before we kind of get into the word association game is uh, what would you tell your 18 year old self? So kind of looping this all back together, um, you know, it could be something from the book in a way it's parenting is similar, but kind of, kind of bringing a bow on all this. What would you tell your, your 18 year old self or your younger self uh, with the, what you know now? Yeah, I think I, I, so. I try to have a, a, a mindset of, of not having regrets. Uh, I talk about this in the book, actually. Like, no regrets when I'm 80 is one of my yeah. one of my mantras. Um, and obviously, the, you know, we make mistakes in life, and there there are things that we wish we would have done differently. But what what I, when I say that, what I mean is anything that I can sort of um, uh, alleviate or or, or fix, uh, like if it's a relationship, let's say, like, oh, I wish that relationship with so and so was better. And that person's still alive, then uh, it's a reminder to me that I can I can actually still reach out to that person and I can make that right. Um, but you know, I think if if there was an undo button or if there was a way to go back and time travel and and kind of give myself uh, some cheat codes, uh, obviously you know buy Bitcoin early. That's the that's the easy one. Um, but you know, I think another one is is uh, not. 
being so focused on what I'll call activism. And what I mean by that is, you know, there's temptation, I think, when you're when you're young to be like a martyr and, and whatever it is that you're passionate about. And I think I fell into that uh, uh, in my early days and kind of um, fell, fell on the sword probably one too many times because I was really passionate about whatever it was I was passionate about. And uh, I think that would be wisdom for my 18 year old self, because what it says is you might not you may or may not be right about whatever it is that you're, you're passionate about, but it's rarely worth sort of sacrificing um, your your well-being or especially even your uh, your financial well-being. Right. So it's like, uh, you know, quitting like almost rage quitting jobs because, you know, you felt like they weren't telling the truth in, at the level that you wanted to without securing like your next <laughs> your next employment. Um, very practical thing, but I, I did, I did a couple of times in my, in my youth, uh, because I, I was like, so adamant about like writing the wrongs in the world. And so I think my heart was in the right place, but my methods probably could have used some coaching yeah. from, from older, so, wiser yeah. me. Um, and so, so yeah, I think I would probably focus on those two things. Man, that's so good. It really resonates with me as well. Like it's just something that, you know, probably a lot of competitive or alpha men or boys, you know, teenager or whatever, young twenties, like you just, you're, I'm going to change the world. Right. Like it's, it's yeah. Yeah. right Right now, now, right now, everybody, (laughs) no one thinks like me. Yeah. I love that. That's such great advice. Such good advice. Thanks man. All right. So in, in wrapping up here, we have a little, uh, word association game. I got my glad scene card here showing him that earlier. Got some other, you know, the safety got all the different cards here. A lot of them, I should say, a bunch of them. So a new, a new little segment. I always say a new segment um, presented by Bitcoin Trading Cards. A little word association lightning round. So I got like you no know, fifteen words. I'm gonna go through them. Just give me. You can say a couple words you want or a sentence if you want, but get the word maybe something that pops to your head when I when I mention it. Okay. Satoshi it. Satoshi Nakamoto. Ooh, um, mysterious. I like That's it. Word. I don't think I've had that one yet. Uh, family, <laughs> um, like most important key top priority. Love that. Elon Musk. Enigma a little bit. Yeah. Kind of like we were talking mm-hmm. about hard, hard to read. Yes. Uh, parenting. Hmm. Underrated. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, <laughs> writing. Oh, uh, passion. Mm. Bill Gates. Creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, the World Economic Forum. Um, ominous. Mm. Travel. Hmm. Uh, how do I say this? I don't want to say overrated, but can be kind of like overhyped mm. a little bit. Interesting. I like that. That's a, I haven't heard that one the other year. Uh, truth. Truth. Elusive. Ooh, that's a really good one. Politics. Annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Community. Important. Valuable. Faith. Uh, foundational. I like that. Integrity. Uh, hmm. I want to say good integrity is like irreversible. Like it's like mm-hmm. you only get one shot at some, at some level of, of being a person of integrity. Yeah, that's really good. Uh, last two Bitcoin trading cards. Fun. It. Cool idea. Yeah. And Bitcoin magazine. Um polarizing. Mm. And actually you'll do one more <laughs> too. Your 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 books. Thank God for Bitcoin and uh the the new one. I'm not your bra. I'm not your bra. Um I would say valuable bias, but I think, it's, I think they're they're good so books. Good. You should read them. Yeah, they're they're <laughs> so good. I've got. Speaking of that, I don't I don't have your new one with me actually. Unfortunately, I forgot it. But I've got this one. <laughs> so, Let's go. Yeah. I got this one. <laughs> there Boom. we go. Let's go. 
let's go guys <laughs> so yes right under uh, my copy of uh the communist manifesto so you gotta n- oh, know perfect. thy enemy <laughs> know thy enemy and wars a racket so okay <laughs> so you're in good you're in good company uh some well-known books uh, right there so amazing yes gotta know thy enemy but also oh. know the uh, the truth so get george get george's books um, we'll link to those yeah. and, uh, you passed, you passed the test though at the end. That's the most important thing. So that's stressful, <laughs> know, man. Little pop quiz. <laughs> didn't mean to, uh, put too much stress on you, but uh, no, thank you. No, thank fun. you so much, George. Where can people find you at? Yeah. So I'm, uh, at G McHale, uh, on Twitter, G M E K H A I L. Uh, it's probably where I'm most active and, um, yeah, would love to connect with anybody. If you, you have questions or feedback uh, about the book, I'd love to hear it. But uh, it's on Amazon. It's kind of hard to find on Amazon, I'm finding. You have there's to put, I am not your bra, and then yeah. book. Because there's, <laughs> yeah, the yeah. there's a lot of merch. There's a lot of like garbage merch. Like So you have to put book in the search bar, um, or you can search me as an author, and it should come up. But, uh, but yeah, check it out. It's also on BitcoinMagazine.com. If you do buy it, would appreciate a review on Amazon. It's uh, probably the most helpful thing for authors um, to, uh, to get the word out. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. So we'll link to those uh, as well. So please go do that. Awesome content. And, and like I said, Bitcoin mag, we'll link to those, a lot of content there that you have, and just everyone in general, uh, but, um, so much good stuff there. So thank you, George, for being a playable character in a sea of non-playable characters. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Cheers. If you enjoyed this show with George McHale, I think you really will enjoy the interview I just did with Jeff Booth. In the last few weeks, where we talk about AI, 3D printing, and when we talk some crazy price predictions, he clarifies those. Or you're going to want to check out the Max Kaiser interview that I just did in the past month, directly after Donald Trump talked at the Bitcoin conference. They talked about how we find out who Satoshi is, is Bitcoin sent by God, and some crazy price predictions as well. Check that out here. We look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for watching Playable Characters.